The hearing today is called Blasphemy Laws and Censorship by States and Non-State Actors Examining Global Threats to Freedom of Expression. Record will begin our panel, panel one. Welcome, Ambassador. We have David Saperstein of the United State State Department, Ambassador at Large for International Religious Freedom. The existence of blasphemy laws creates the kind of environment that led to the death of a young Afghan woman named Farkunda at the hands of an angry mob or the Pakistani Christian couple, Mr. Chairman, that you alluded to, burned alive in a brick kiln, or the dozens of targeted killings of Ahmadi Muslims in Pakistan that we have seen in recent years. Um, we'll so now begin panel two, and I'll introduce uh, our next witness, Reverend Thomas J. Reese is the chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Two prisoners, Asi Abibi and Abdul Shakur, are especially to be recognized. Asi Abibi, a farmhand and mother of five, argued with fellow laborers in June of 2009 about if the, the water she bought, brought was unclean because she is a Christian. Co-workers' complaints to a cleric about her alleged derogatory comments about the Prophet Muhammad led to a police investigation in her arrest and prosecution for blasphemy. After being sentenced to death in 2010, and having her appeal dismissed and her death sentence upheld, the Pakistan Supreme Court finally in July of 2015 suspended her death sentence until her appeal could be heard. She remains imprisoned and in October of 2015 was put into isolation due to safety concerns for her. Abdul Shakur was sentenced in, in January of 2016 to five years in prison on blasphemy charges and three years on terrorism charges for propagating the Ahmadi Muslim faith, which is banned in Pakistan. Shakur sold copies of the Quran in Ahmadi uh, publications. Mob violence and vigilantism is another consequence of Pakistan's blasphemy laws. And then we have Nina Shea, uh, director of the Hudson Institute Center for Religious Freedom. Nina has worked as a lawyer specifically focusing on religious freedom in American foreign policy for 30 years. Um, for over 20 years, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation has been the leading proponent of the international, for the international adoption and enforcement of criminal laws against blasphemy against Islam. The OIC doesn't define what it means by this, but its leading member states practices are illustrative. Millions of Baha'is and Ahmadiyyas have been condemned as de, de facto insulters of Islam, frequently persecuted by OIC governments and attacked by vigil, vigilantes with impunity. Those seeking to leave Islam face similar fates. Religious minorities, including Christians, are disproportionately accused of blasphemy. And finally, Dr. Wael Aliji is a Syrian-born British doctor and psychologist with a special interest in political psychology and narrative analysis of political Islam movements. Easy. Laws that restrict access to uh, places of worship uh, family laws that restrict marriage op options to within recognized religious groups, which force adherence of non-recognized groups, such as Yazidis, Ahmadiyya, or Baha'is, to identify with one of the recognized ones. Uh, laws criminalizing apostasy and uh, blasphemy. Studying anti-blasphemy laws in Pakistan, Nigeria, Indonesia, showed that uh, countries that criminalize blasphemy tend to foster an environment in which terrorism is more prevalent, legitimized, and insidious. 
it seems fair to say in that context that terrorism and blasphemy are inextricably intertwined, as uh, Amjad Mahmoud Khan said. 